build began, it was originally just supposed to be an engine swap, some body work, and some aero, but that quickly unraveled when I realized there was room for improvement everywhere. As a result, we decided to build pretty much every aspect of the suspension of this car from scratch. We have taken and removed every single Ferrari part from this car. We've made really good progress, but one of the big things left on the list is steering. We have no way to control those front wheels. So I want to fix that in this episode, and we're going to start off over on the lathe. We are going to build our own turnbuckles, tie rod ends, we're going to modify some steering arms, and we're going to dial in our bump steer and see if we can get the front end all ready for wheels and tires. Then we're going to boot up Fusion 360 and design a slew of parts for the back end and see just how much progress we can make, because I have a pretty good feeling we're going to have our rotiform wheels very soon. So let's get after it. Over the last few episodes, we've been hard at work getting the car ready for wheels and tires. The moment they show up, I want to be able to bolt them on and set this thing on the ground for the very first time. So let's take a look behind the recently installed spindles and brake rotors and see what we're working with. We've got this steering arm bolted to the back of the spindle, and we have the original tie rod end still attached to the steering rack. The problem is, is even if we bolted them together, that tie rod end is the complete wrong taper for our steering arm. And even if we could bolt them together, the tie rods themselves are not nearly long enough since we widened the track width. Full lock is only about 20 degrees of steering. So let's see how we can rectify this. Ideally, I'd like to replace the original tie rod end with a heim joint. This will give us a lot more versatility, and it'll help us solve some of the problems we're going to run into further down the road. Let's take a look at the steering arm. If we take a look at the actual tie rod mount hole, you'll notice that it is tapered for a tie rod end. It's just much larger than the one that's on the Ferrari. What I'd like to do is drill it out. I'd like to put a 5 8 bolt through this hole and then run that through the center of a heim joint. So let's start there. I've got the steering arm clamped in a vise and then that vise is clamped to the work surface of my drill press. This rickety old thing ain't perfect, but it's plenty good enough for this job. While we bore this out, don't forget, if you're enjoying this content and you want to support the channel, leave a like, leave a comment, or subscribe if you haven't yet. We're getting closer and closer to finishing this car, and I want to make sure you guys see the video of when we finally take it for the first drive. As one might hope, we can now run a bolt through our steering arm and attach a heim joint to it. So that means next we need to build a turnbuckle that'll thread onto the heim joint shaft. I'm going to be using 2024 aluminum hex bar, and my reason for choosing that particular alloy is because it has significant strength properties over standard 6061 aluminum. It's not going to be as easy to machine, but it'll yield a better finished product for what we're trying to do. And as far as machinability goes, it doesn't even really matter anyway. I'm faking the funk and learning to use this lathe as I go. On top of that, my cutting tools are both cheap and dull, so we'll see what we wind up with. I'm following my tap drill chart in order to understand what size hole we need to put in the end of this thing so that we can thread it for our Heimrod shaft. To actually tap this hole, we're going to be using this left-handed thread 5 8 tap. I'll show you why we're using left-handed threads here in a moment, but for now, let's just take a look at how this went. Unfortunately, something somewhere was amiss. It tapped some threads, but they are barely there, and after inserting the heim joint one time, it blew all of the threads right out of the piece. So, we've got to restart this and do it with a slightly smaller drill bit. I'm not entirely sure what went wrong, and I'm sure the viewers that know how to use a lathe could easily point it out, but as always, I like to show my mistakes in the learning process because I get things wrong too. Thankfully, the second time around, everything worked exactly as it should, and I was even feeling confident enough to put some finishing touches on the part. Last but not least, I wanted to clean the imperfections off of the surface of the part so we have a nice finished piece. I simply sanded each face down and then scotch brighted it for the finished result, and I'm really happy with how these turned out. Are they perfect? No, but this is definitely my biggest lathe project yet, and they came out really well. On one side, we've got our 5 8 left-hand thread, and on the other, we have right-hand half 20. The finished part assembly looks great, it all bolts together, so let's get this installed on the car. A 
A few of you out there caught it, and probably find it rather odd that there are imperial threads to thread onto the steering rack. And I'm surprised too, there is nothing else SAE on the entire car. I would have expected it to be M12-175, but it wasn't. As for the left-hand threads of the heim joint, you can see here how they work. Those left-hand threads mean we can turn the turnbuckle to change the toe alignment and simply lock it into place with nuts. Ladies and gentlemen, we have steering. Now, I know that it's kind of silly to be excited about because it should work and that's what it needs and so on and so forth, but it's pretty exciting to be able to turn my steering column and to have my wheels turning. Check it out. Yeah, I know, it's obvious and it should work that way, but it's rewarding. This is one of the big hurdles left towards getting this suspension solved. But there are two things that we've got to figure out next. The first one is we've got a bunch of bump steer, but we were planning for that. And second is Ackerman angle. Let's solve bump steer and then we'll talk Ackerman. Bump steer is exactly what it sounds like. It's when the wheel travels upwards as though it's going over a bump and an adverse steering effect is introduced. I'm simulating it here by using a jack underneath the lower control arm and traveling the suspension through its range of motion. You can see that the wheel, or in this case the brake rotor, is turning through the up travel and we really don't want that. You can see from this angle that it's introduced by the fact that the angle of the tie rod itself does not match the angle of the control arms. Of course, it doesn't help that nothing's really bolted together all that well, but the point still stands. Fortunately, we can solve this with some spacers. I machined a few on the lathe, and we can try them out to figure out exactly how much of a spacer we need in order to mitigate the bump steer entirely. I landed on one that's just shy of two inches in overall length, and it has pitched the tie rod up, and it now matches the angle of our control arms. There's still a little bit of fine tuning to do to get it perfect, but you can see now that we have eliminated almost all of the bump steer entirely. Now, plenty of you guys are gonna point out the fact that this is a very long lever arm to be steering with and we should probably reinforce it, so let's talk about it. Because we have such a long bump steer spacer in place, the tie rod is pushing at the end of a very long lever. And although it's a 5 8 inch bolt, that's still a lot of torque to be applying to this steel arm. It would likely be okay, but I'd like to reinforce it by adding a second arm that will attach either to the spindle by welding it or to that bolt back there, some sort of secondary reinforcement that can come over and make this more rigid. However, before we do that, we need to confirm the position of this point in relation to the spindle. That is called Ackerman, so let's talk about it really quick. Now this is probably gonna be a little bit technical and a little bit nerdy, and I'm also probably not gonna do the best job of explaining it. So if you wanna just skip ahead, I'll put a bar at the bottom and you can do that. But Ackerman angle refers to the difference between your front wheels and how much each one steers through a turn. When you turn your wheel, your wheels do not turn the same amount, believe it or not. And here's why. If you imagine yourself turning in a big circle around a fixed point, the inside front wheel is traveling in a smaller circle than the outside front wheel. And in order to get both of your front wheels turning on a proper circle and not fighting each other, you have to get the Ackerman angle of your steering arms correct. Now, thankfully, there are some pretty simple equations and diagrams that you can follow in order to do that. All we have to do is measure our wheelbase and our front track width, and we can plot it out. Now, I have not done the math yet, but I feel pretty confident we can nail it, and I think we can do that pretty easily. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take our steering arms and simply flip them side to side and then machine them slightly. And I'm pretty confident that's gonna get us really, really close. I need to do the math first, but we'll solve that in a future episode. I'm not gonna worry about it right now. It's not gonna keep us from making progress. And truth be told, the car will probably drive just fine the way it is. You don't do much steering input on road racing and it already is eh, sort of close. But we'll get it right. I wanna get it right, it's worth doing. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing correctly. With that said, we're gonna worry about it later. Right now, I wanna worry about getting coilovers mounted on the car. So let's figure out how we're gonna do that. 
You'll notice that we do have the original coilover mount or shock mount up in the front of the car. It shares a bolt with the upper control arm. But the problem is there's nothing through which we can mount the eyelet of the bottom of the coilover on the control arm itself. We need to add a mount to the control arm for the coilover to bolt to. And the same thing goes for the rear. Initially, we were gonna use the coilover mount or shock mount in the rear at the top, but we've used it for our crossbar in the engine bay, and instead, I'd like to relocate this mount to right here at this junction. For one, because it's a lot stronger, and two, because it's in better alignment. We need to build a mount on the control arm itself somewhere down here. So let's move over to Fusion 360 and see if we can draw something that'll work. What we have here is my drawing for my front lower control arm, and attached to it are the mounts for the bottom of the front coilover. Because we need these to support the weight of the car and all of the load transmitted through the coilover, we're going to build these brackets out of 3 16 plate steel, and we have a load plate beneath them. This should reinforce the control arm itself and ensure that it can take the load of hopping curbs on the racetrack as well as any potholes we might encounter on the street. And as always, these are designed so that we can unfold them in CAD and have these mounts laser cut from flat steel stock. With this drawing complete, I can send it off to Send Cut Send. The rear control arm gets the exact same treatment. Because the control arm is so small, this looks scaled up, but trust me, this is a small, simple mount for the bottom mount of the coilover at the back of the car. Up next is the upper coilover mount that we need to add to the rear. This is the simple mount design that I came up with, and we can cut it out of three simple pieces of flat stock. It's got a notch so that it can clear some welds on the chassis that are there from the factory, and the rest of its contours so that we can make full contact around its perimeter. This should be a really strong mount that, once again, can support any load we throw at it. I don't want to carry on about CAD any longer than we have to, but while I was at it, I also took the time to design the tow link mount for the back of the car. In a sense, this will serve the exact same purpose that our steering rack did at the front, but instead of allowing the rear wheels to turn, it will hold them in place. It'll allow for tow adjustment at the back, but keep anything from moving throughout the wheel's travel. We're going to eliminate bump steer using this system, and it should work very efficiently. The back side of this thing is angled so that it can match the angle of the chassis, and we should relatively easily be able to weld it into place, but it might take a little bit of finessing. The last thing on the list is that I redesigned our intercooler mount. I showed this in a previous episode, but after thinking about it a little bit, I saw a lot of room for improvement and a way to add in bushings without making the mount cumbersome. If we spin this thing around and look at the other side, you can get a little bit of an idea of what it looks like behind the aluminum ears that will be attached to the intercooler itself. We've got a space for a steel sleeve inside of a poly bushing that should help isolate the intercooler from vibration and keep it from fatiguing. I've taken all of the DXF files from all of these pieces that we've just taken a look at and sent them off to be cut, and hopefully we'll have them soon. So all that stuff's designed. It's already been sent out to cut. In fact, I sent it last week. We should have it this week for maybe Friday's episode. We'll have to see. But with that stuff out of the way, we do have some other time to kill, and we spent some time in the last episode installing our rear wing, and now I want to address the fitment of the carbon engine cover because it's not good. If you have keen eyes, there's no question that you've seen just how poorly this engine cover has fit in the past. It doesn't sit down and match the sail panel lines at all. So the first step is to get this thing removed and remove the original hinges that held the original engine cover that was made of steel. These things sit quite proud of the sail panels and I think removing them will give us a bit of a drop for the engine cover we want to fit. It did take some time to figure out how to remove them though. The hardware is buried up in the sail panel and is completely inaccessible even with fancy tools but I found out that the heads of that hardware are on the inside of the car and completely buried under spray on sound deadening. I spent some time nervously attacking it with a screwdriver, attempting to scrape it away just enough to get a socket on the heads of the bolts. And to say I was worried about puncturing through something and clipping that rear glass is an understatement. But thankfully, it only took about an hour to get the hinges out, so we'll set them aside just in case we need them in the future, but for now, they're out of the way. The carbon hood can go back on the car, and we can take the necessary steps to get this thing fitted correctly. Even with the hinges out of the way, there was clearly still some interference between the carbon and the sail panel. 
The edges of the hood were relatively poorly shaped, so I decided to finger file away some of the excess material and hope that I didn't pierce the edge of it and open up the inner cavity. Clearly, removing that material did have a positive effect, and after another attempt or two at finessing that edge, I got one part of the hood at least fitting somewhat nicely. The problem though is that when one side starts to fit, the other just gets worse. I had a series of clamps holding this entire thing into place, hoping that perhaps the use of hood pins and special connectors in the future could get it to stay where it is. But even still, some of the gaps just aren't quite right. They're close, and I'm sure they could be made to fit, but honestly, the closer you look, the worse it gets. At the bottom of the driver's side sail panel, there's a gap big enough for me to stick the tip of my finger, and if we follow that gap all the way to the back of the car, it is inconsistent to say the least. And on the other side of the car, things are in equally bad shape. The side of the panel sags rather low over the rear quarter, and the gaps at the top of the sail panel are all out of whack. Am I nitpicking? No question. But do I want it to be perfect? No question again. Honestly, I'm just not happy with the way the engine cover fits. It could be made to work. I could have a body guy start adding material and taking material away and massaging it to do its thing, but I don't know if that's worth it. There are other carbon engine covers out there that are much more modern and probably better made. I would assume they would fit better too. Or there is a steel engine cover in the back that fits perfectly if I want to just cut some slots in it. I don't know that I do, but I know that I'd have the outcome that I want. Don't get me wrong, it'd be really easy to say, dude, it's a race car. Those body gaps don't matter. and. That is true, but they do matter to me. I don't want to sacrifice quality just because it's a race car. That's not my style. So I'll have to do some thinking and some soul searching to decide what's really gonna be right there. And while we're talking about the back of the car, I do want to address something that a lot of you guys commented about in the last episode. You said, dude, those wing uprights are not gonna hold it steady. Look at how wobbly it is. You're totally right. I tried to make it pretty clear, but sometimes I miss the mark. These are just templates, they're just mock-ups. We're gonna cut these out of carbon. Now that everything is done back here, I'm gonna draw those up. That'll probably be for next episode. We'll do some carbon cutting and get some stuff made. So with that said about the engine cover, I think that's all I've got for this episode. We do have a lot of parts on the way and fingers crossed they will be here for Friday's episode so that we can get back into some fabrication. And hopefully by Tuesday's episode next week, we will have the suspension completely wrapped up, save for final welding and actually installing coilovers because we don't have them yet. But we can put some turnbuckles in place so we can set the car down. I'm gonna give Rotoform a call. I'm gonna find out how our wheels are doing. Maybe we'll have those pretty soon. But with that said, I got my work cut out for me as always. So I'll catch you guys on Friday. I'll figure out what we're going to be tackling and I'll see you then. Thanks as always for the support.